All right. Mic check, check, I'm good. So I'm Max Ron, Max, Max Ron, CWB Association Welding Podcast, Pod, Pod, Podcast. Today we have a really cool guest, Welding Podcast. The show is about to begin. Hello and welcome to another edition of the CWB Association Podcast. My name is Max Saron with you guys as always. And today we have a fantastic show with a lady called Courtney Chard. Did I say that right or is it Chard? You did. No, it's Chard. Chard. All right. So Courtney is coming to us from Ontario and I have her listed here as a UA pipe welder. Now, is that what your official title is? Uh, yes, we're pressure welders. Um with UA Local 46 Toronto. I'm also a licensed steam fitter. Okay, so you went through the entire apprenticeship program, then through the pipe fitters, and and obviously are Red Seal endorsed now? Yes, in okay. both trades. In both trades, cool. And, you know, dual cert. Maybe we'll talk about that later, because I'm also dual certed. That's a big thing now in the world. It's, it's, it's really like the next level. It seems to be how a lot of the unions are going also. They mm-hmm. prefer their members to have dual tickets. Cool. So Courtney, let's, let's go back. Um, you know, when you, uh, were coming up in the world, like, like what was your first run at a career? Like, did you know you want to get into pipe fitting? Like, I mean, that's a pretty specific area of welding. Like, how did you find yourself finding it? Cause that's not an accident. Like that's, there's gotta be some dots there, right? Right. So I'm a second generation uh, UA member. My father was a pipeline welder in Local 46, and he also had a shop on, on our property um, where he would, you know, work on buckets and loaders and trucks when he wasn't working on the pipeline. So I was exposed to this since I was born. Um, and he always was very proud of what he did. And um that really showed. And so, you know, growing up, you hear about it at the dinner table, you hear the stories, you know, you go to the union hall with your dad, well, he goes, pays his dues, whatever. So it was always present in my life. I was a bit of a tomboy growing up, but still going through school, it wasn't mentioned in any of my guidance. Uh, my None of my guidance counselors kind of addressed it. None of my teachers really addressed that women could go into construction. So you're kind of like, told by your guidance counselors, you got to choose college or university and you get the books and you look through what those colleges or universities offer and you just kind of pick something because that's what you do. So I did and I went into law and security. It was a two-year program at Sheridan College. Immediately hated it, knew I hated it. But again, you got to finish it because you don't want to be a dropout and a failure. Mm -hmm. So these are all like, um, you're afraid of judgment, right? And then you didn't have anything to go by. So finally, I got enough courage after completing the law and security course, saying to my father, you know what, I want to get into the trades because I wanted to do something different. I had that kind of, I wasn't a girly girl, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I was interested in it. And he was actually very supportive. He said, all right, like get in the shop, let's go kind of thing. So I had, even though I was raised around it, it still wasn't presented to me as an option because I'm 42. So you and I've been in the trade almost since, yeah, 2002. So it still wasn't a common thing. And it wasn't anything that the schools were introducing young women to. You know, that brings up so. two really important things. Uh, number one, I have the same story. My dad was a boiler maker. I grew up around welding. It was always around me. But I didn't go to school for welding. Like, out of out of high school, I went to university. And it was like, you're supposed to go to university. Even though I knew I liked welding and i i had been up with my dad you know we would talk stuff at work and or at, at home about projects and cool things and he would bring me home like little doodads to play with and you know in the shop and stuff i always knew about welding and obviously it was a good life like i mean we had food on the table and a house and obviously my dad did good in the trades but it was never like okay well you just follow in his footsteps it was like no 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 you got to go to school and do something better. You know, like you need to yes. re- reach higher. And that leads me to the second point. Like I literally had a meeting this morning with an apprenticeship forum about how guidance counselors are not getting the information out to students. And trust me, all the unions, all the uh, apprenticeship groups across Canada send the information 
two guidance counselors, but somehow it doesn't get out to the students. And like, why is there that disconnect? And you know, there's a few theories behind it um, in terms of why that doesn't happen. One of them being guidance counselors went to university, right? So if I said, Courtney, can you go promote med school? What would you do? <laughs> yeah, right. Right. You don't. I'm not qualified to. That's right. You don't even know. know where to start. Exactly. You don't even know where to start. You don't know anything about it. So how can you talk to somebody else about it? And that's kind of what's happening with guidance counselors. They have an education degree, maybe a social work degree, and we're saying go promote welding. Well, what the heck do they know about welding, right? So that's kind of like the the trying to get people into the schools, like perhaps you or me actually going to the schools and talking about it because we know, right? We actually know and we have a history and not expecting guidance counselors to, to, to do that because they have no idea, right? That's right. And actually, um, I do spend a lot of time with Local 46 and Skills Ontario, Skills Canada. I work with as an ambassador and same with my daughter. She's seven. She's an ambassador for kick-ass careers and we go into schools and we educate the youth about the trades um, through um, mentorship and even still and we so you would think to go to the high schools well it's been proven that you have to reach these children in grade five, five six yeah. seven eight and so we go into these uh, ele elementary schools and we speak to them and even still if you even get like three kids it's a big deal. Like, and we're talking to like 20, 30 kids at a time. And even still, even going into the schools, the stats seem to be still low about, especially for getting the girls in yeah. um, to the trades. Yeah. And you know, I don't know what the reason is, but we keep trying. It's well, education, you know, awareness, and getting the parents on board too. Like you exactly. said, even having a trade parent, and I've even heard it from you know, plumbers, steam fitters, and welders I work with, they'll be working and like, my kid's not getting into the trade. And I go, why? It's a, it supported us. It's, it's a mm -hmm. great living. Why? And they don't really give an answer. It's like, well, I don't want them to work like that. Like they don't really have an answer. So it's, uh, it's interesting to change the mindset, I guess. Yeah. And you're a hundred percent right. Yeah. And then it's like, well, how do you do that? And I think we are doing it. Like, I mean, we're doing it right now. This podcast, this is part of it. And and I feel like there's kind of a, a stigma out there that it's that it's not glamorous. And I and I think that it is. And you know, people are looking at me like I'm crazy. And it's like, what are you talking about? I feel I've always felt like welders are like the hockey players of trades because you know we make the rock stars. Yeah, we're the rock stars. We make good money. We travel around the world. We do lots of cool stuff. We can make our own hours in a lot of, in a lot of different ways. We can, we're very mobile in terms of what we can do. And why aren't we showing that? Like <laughs> I just, yesterday I said to someone, you know, how come there's no TV shows where the main character is a welder? You know, there's firemen, there's policemen, there's doctors, there's carpentry, there's everything on TV, but no main character is ever a welder. It should be like, why are we not glamorous? And I think that's part of it. I go do talks in elementary schools too, and I try to make it as cool as I can. Like, I'll bring out my sports car, and I'll like, you know, try to make it look like, hey, like, you know, doctors aren't the only people out there doing awesome. You know, welders do awesome too. You know, and and that's you, right. And we should be proud of that, not hide it, not be shy about it. It's cool. Like, why not? Yes, that's true. Uh, we need um, maybe the movie Flashdance from the 80s. We need a TV series. <laughs> Have you ever watched how she welds in that movie, though? It makes me so mad. It's like, she's not welding. <laughs> yeah. No, but it's still kind of cool. It is cool. <laughs> people, used to, people used to say to me, oh, you're like Flashdance. I'm like, yeah, my life's exactly like that. <laughs> All right. So, so you went into, into the law and security was, of course, I think you said you took for a couple of years. So I had to go right. back. Did you slide right into apprenticeship or did you just kind of work at a shop for a bit as a laborer? Like what was kind of your path just starting in? So because my father was a union welder, I didn't really any um, entertain any other option. I just assumed, okay, so he's a union welder with UA Local 46. So then I just go into the local and we do an intake. And that's basically what happened. I went into the local when we did an intake. I went through the whole process. You know, you do your mechanical aptitude test, your application, and then your interview. And then you sign on with the government in the, in the union and you start your apprenticeship. 
So I did do though this one thing because I think I had to wait a couple months till we were taking in apprentices. So during those couple months, I would I signed on with the local college, Sheridan College again, but they did like weekend courses and they had some trade school courses. So there was blueprint reading and there was um, like I, a Saturday course where I could take some welding and my dad could teach me, yes, but then there's no documentation. Hmm. So you're just saying, oh, I know. But when you sign on as an apprentice, for any experience you have, they'll take time off your apprenticeship, your hours per year, right? Yep. So I had the proper documentation saying, you know, I spent X number of hours in welding. So then that counted off my hours in and, apprenticeship, and that's which awesome. was good. And it benefited me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, college... So I do advise people to do that. Exactly. I was just about to say that. Across Canada, people may not realize that uh, colleges offer nights and weekend courses all over the place. And because they're done in a college and you have an actual instructor, you do get certificates and they are hours. Maybe it's only 40 hours or 80 hours or whatever, but Hey, they all add up. And, and you know what? The really interesting thing is when I was, well, a couple things. Number one, when I got a, a job now into management and they start looking at your work experience, all those little certificates add up because they have like benchmarks where they say like 500 hours of training gets you this, 500 hours of training gets you that. So, you know, you start adding up the forklift, the, oh, you know, fall arrest, uh, all the, you know, all these little certifications you've had over your career, all of a sudden you're like way over 500 hours of training that you didn't even realize and you get a big pay bump. And I was like, what? what the, how did that you happen? You do. You know? And, it, yeah. And so that's awesome, you know? And the second thing is that when you are like yourself, a dual certified red seal, your first red seal knocks time off your second red seal, which a lot of people don't know. And that's, that's awesome. Right. Right. And that's exactly what happens with the welding because the steam fitter and plumbing is a five-year apprenticeship and the welding's a third, a three-year apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. So usually what uh, the UA's kind of strategy is when you're a third year um, plumbing or steam fitting apprentice, they then allow you to start doing your welding and then you roughly finish them at the same time. So that's generally how we do it in our training department and it works out very well. We mm-hmm. find that if you just kind of are an apprentice for welding, it's very difficult to get your hours because a lot of companies don't want to be responsible or have an apprentice welder. Um, they're a little more leery of it. So um, it's harder to kind of get your hours in and, and get out of your time. So we find that if we do the dual ticket, it, it just goes a lot more smoothly and um, we're able to move those individuals through their apprenticeship and they're not stuck, um, you know, in, in a third year situation for Mm -hmm. years, like they just can't get out. Right. You know, and, and that's something that is confusing to me. Because every province has a different system. And I wish that apprenticeship mm-hmm, systems would be the same everywhere. Like, for in, for example, in Saskatchewan, we don't have uh, the welding as a designated trade in terms of it's mandatory to be an apprentice. You can go work at a shop as a welder without ever going to school ever, ever. And have a, like a 30-year great welding career, pays great and everything. But you never went to school. There's no red seal. There's nothing. Um, but... You can also, at any point, take your hours of your work life and go get them signed off at the apprenticeship board if you decide to challenge or go back to school. Some places don't do that. Some provinces don't do that. Some do. Some allow for mobility. So some will say, well, if you don't work for an apprentice shop, you aren't apprenticing, which I think is baloney because, you know, some small shops aren't apprentice shops. They're just a shop to weld at. And that should still count because that's valid, you know. But then how do you count that? It's, it gets confusing. It does. Um, now, Ontario, it's not a compulsory trade as a welder. Mm-hmm. So you do not have to go and write your red seal. However, if you want to go work in Alberta, they require that mm-hmm. you have your red seal. So if you want to travel, then you should have it. And then now in Ontario, other places like refineries prefer yeah. the welder to have the red seal, even though it's not compulsory. You it, don't and need it makes to, sense have, to why. have it to be a welder. Because like, it makes sense because like the Red Seal program isn't easy. You learn a lot. Like it's, it's good to have that education, Mm -hmm. right? So, 
All right. Yeah. So you you started off in, on the steam fitter plumbing side. Entering into the program, even though you had a bit of a back history and, and you felt like you were built for this, you know, like you're ready to do it. Was there like was any major obstacles right off the top that you're like, ah, I don't like this or I do like this or anything that threw you off or, or did it go smoothly for you? So, no, I, I had my challenges for sure. Um, there was, you know, in trade school, nobody wanted to be my partner in class. Um, Were you the only girl wanna, in your group? You know, or? Certain, uh, I was the only girl and um, I, I'm still today mostly the only girl on a site. Um, and, you know, I don't think people know how to react to you sometimes or, you know, and I had it. I had when I went first went as a first year with my company, the steam fitters didn't want me on their crew, even though I was a steam fitter. So I ended up going to the plumbing crew. So I had, you know, experiences like that. Um, I had challenges when I was pregnant because the employer wanted me to leave earlier, but I didn't want to leave earlier because if I did, then that would take time off my maternity leave. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, since, since then our UA, um, Canada has different programs now to help women who are pregnant and have to leave earlier. They subsidize and top up pays and help them out, but that didn't exist when I was pregnant. So there was definitely challenges. And a lot of my challenges were put on myself. Like I always thought, oh, I have to do better and be mm. better. And, you know, so I was putting a lot of pressure on myself. And, um, you know, I didn't realize that your best is going to be different every day. And sometimes your best is just going to be showing up <laughs> and getting out of bed. <laughs> um, you know, so I, you know, I just put a lot of pressure on myself. And then the fact that my dad was really well known in the local, everyone's like, oh, Courtney was welding since she was like five. And, you know, that was not the case at all. I started welding in my 20s. Yeah. So then you had this pressure to be like, to be awesome, as good as your dad right away. And that just doesn't happen. I mean, I think the first five years of learning how to weld, you don't even know what you're looking at. You know, it's mm -hmm. like you're learning like how to read that puddle, right? But, yeah. You know, so I don't know. See, it's my, a lot of that. My stuff, dad was sure. a good welder. Like, I mean, I'd say that I'm as good a welder as my dad, which, you know, he's going to listen to this and be like, yeah, right. But okay. um, <laughs> but my dad uh, has like a degree in metallurgy from like back in Chile. So like I'm pretty good at metallurgy. I do metallurgy videos online and, and I love teaching metallurgy. But my dad knows way more and like i mean there's times i gotta like call him up and be like okay like what if i put like a one percent like nickel in here like i have no idea what that'll do and he'll be like well the molecules will blah 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 and i'll be like wow, wow. <laughs> like the most boring course <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey don't say that i love metallurgy i try to make people passionate yeah. about it <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny though because there's so much science be behind welding Absolutely. and there's so much science like in the pipe and the welding rod and this and that. And then you get out in the field somewhere and it's like windy, your rods are wet. Everything's like a disaster. And they're like, hurry up. And by the way, it's got a pest x-ray. And yeah. you're just like, crank yeah, it up. Okay, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Where like, you know, all this science went behind it and all this thought, and then you're in the field and you just got to make it happen in the rain. Yeah. You're using so, yeah, two rods to bridge a gap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're like, where's the, where's the quality control now? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so now now you're you're going through, um, the I love the 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 piece you you brought up about being pregnant. Um, I I I I've worked with many women and had, um, many students that were women who have had babies during work, and I've seen them all work full term, like great right to the end, and I've seen the people around them get uncomfortable with them being pregnant. And I've even seen women get pressured to be like, oh, you shouldn't be working because, you know, X and Y. And I always felt that that was wrong. Like, I mean, people make their own choices with their own bodies. And whatever a woman decides to do is between her and her doctor. Because there's, you know, there's no reason that I, I've known or seen or heard that you should stop. I don't know, maybe correct me if I'm wrong. Um, no, so... It was interesting. So Hayden and I actually uh, 
because I didn't know what to do and I didn't have any reference, um, mm -hmm. somebody suggested to me that I should contact the University of Alberta. And they at the time had a study going on called the What Me Study. I, I actually just read that exists. study. Yeah, I found it. Okay, mm -hmm. so it studied women who were in the trades who were pregnant. Uh, and they gathered a lot of data and that study lasted five years because I think Hayden was five and I was still doing like questionnaires and it was really in depth. Mm -hmm. So I felt while I was pregnant that I was doing something that would help others like behind me. And that's the whole thing, right? Like you're supposed to make like it easier for the ones behind you. Mm -hmm. So I was proud of that. And I worked with my doctor and she didn't really know a lot. So we just said, okay, we'll just make sure you wear your PPE. I wore the 3M mask with the P100. Mm -hmm. I really tried to be as careful as I could be. And she had a, a few extra ultrasounds or whatever. But yeah, I had people telling me that if I weld and work while pregnant, like my daughter's gonna come out disabled. And that was horrible mm -hmm. um, because I think as any first time mother or any mother pregnant, you know, you do worry about, you know, statistically something could happen, you know, and then now you're in this trade that nobody knows anything about. And then you have that on your mind also. Um, but Hayden's perfectly healthy and yeah, like she meets that. all her, all her um, benchmarks, what is it? Yeah. Benchmarks or mm -hmm whatever on time or if not earlier and she's fine but it was a, it was definitely definitely scary and then there's also too like so there's highly unionized places where you can work where they have a great um hr and health and safety program like and then there's people, like yeah. those small factories mm -hmm. that and small companies that just don't have you know the support behind them to offer stuff. So I've, I've heard, you know, people say, Oh, I had no problem. It was fine. I went to the office, but that's not always an option for women. Mm -hmm. Um, if it's a smaller company. Yeah. Well, and if you're a single mom and you have like a family, like let's say it's your second or third child, I just don't understand where like someone could come in and say, you can't work. Like, no, no. If, if you want to work, you can work. Like, I mean, that's just, how can someone make a decision for somebody else arbitrarily like that? You know, it's like, well, we, when right. we came to Canada, we were super poor. And I remember my dad had two full-time jobs and my mom had a full-time job. And I was like nine years old and I was home alone. And someone at the school complained to my parents that I shouldn't be home alone. And it's like, yo, like we, we're just trying to survive. Like we're doing the best we can. Like, right. You know, like, and, and I feel like that, that, that's something. And I read that, what me, uh, the, the, the study, I've read actually three studies in the last couple of days. Cause this just came up in my, my world a few weeks ago. Someone was qu asking questions about it. And, you know, the studies are interesting cause they're all largely inconclusive. Um, they find that if, you wear no PPE and you take in eight hours of welding fumes a day, you can reduce the birth weight of the baby by a couple grams. And, you know, that's, but no, no disabilities, no found issues, no like more to increase mortality rate, nothing like that. It was just, you know, lower birth weights was one of the larger issues, but then in parentheses, they'd be like, but the lower birth weights could also be because the woman's working at a physical job eight hours a day, so they're not gaining weight like other nor women that are not working. That's right. So the low birth weights could actually just be from them being healthier. Like, <laughs> so it really, at the end of the day, didn't say much um, about it. At, from my point of view, it's a personal choice. People need to do what they find is best. And for the women out there having babies, do what you feel is right. That's right. Exactly. All right, so we're at the halfway mark here. We're going to take a quick break. I love this conversation. It's awesome. You're a good source of information for me, so I'm going to pick your brain some more. But uh, we're going to take a break. We'll be back uh, in like 30 seconds after the sponsors. So thanks for tuning in. I'm with Courtney Chard, and I'm Max Ron, and we'll be right back. And we're back here on the CWB Association podcast. I'm Max Ron. We have Courtney Chard from the... Uh, pipe fitters, union, Stephen fitters, plumbers out of uh, Ontario. She's here uh, representing her union and also her career. And, uh, well, teaching me lots of awesome stuff, which is the point of the guests. So thanks for being here, Courtney. I love the conversation so far. Thank you. I'm having a good time. All right. So 
you're done school. Now, you said that the system you went through kind of gets you ticketed both ways, but you still need a pile of hours there, right? So after you were done out of school, yeah, did you already have your hours and you're ready to cha- to like write your Red Seal tests, or you know how did you accumulate that time? I was ready. Um, I actually worked pretty steady through my apprenticeship. Um, we don't count overtime uh, towards your hours because it's not fair to the apprentice who doesn't get overtime. So it's just your regular 36 hours that get counted. But because I listened to my journeyman and one of my journeymen said, whenever you get told to go to school, you do your school. You don't say no, no, and you don't pass it up. So because I listened to that advice, whenever I got called to school, basic, intermediate, and advanced, I, I went, I did the two months, and then everything aligned, and it was pretty much the perfect timing, and which is, it's done on purpose like that. Mm-hmm, yeah. <laughs> so um, I was ready to write after my advance, and it was still fresh in my head. So it worked out perfect for that. Um, I didn't have any the economy was good. So I didn't have to deal with any recessions. There was no, I I got really lucky because, you know, you hear people who were like early nineties trying to get through their apprenticeships. They said, you know, a five-year apprenticeship took like seven, eight years just because there was just no work. So I was very blessed with that and the timing of everything. Okay, cool. So now you're in the field. Like, I mean, that process takes a few years, so five years and, and you're, got your tickets and, and you're working at the hall what kind of projects are you on now like what's your what's your what's your hustle what's your what's the thing that you like to do and that you're known for now you know what my thing is I am now creating metal art so I make sculptures out of metal and awesome. that seems to have turned into um quite an quite a good little business and I want to continue to do that but I want to get my name out there I'd like to get some galleries selling my pieces Mm -hmm. so that's where I'm at right now and I'm really enjoying it it's um I seem to have a a talent for it and people seem to appreciate my work and um I get requests to make commissioned pieces and it's um it's been a lot of fun so I've really been enjoying that no that's amazing even though it's been yeah thank you even though it's been COVID it's um I guess people are spending more time on the internet so they're you know listening to podcasts or they're on their Instagram and Facebook. So they're seeing this stuff and I seem to be able to get some sales and it's, it's been amazing. Yeah. The dream come true actually to uh, be I, an artist. I don't even grasp that. Like I, I, I build a lot of stuff, but I'm not artsy. Like I don't have the mind to <laughs> see the thing that people build. Like, I can make something that's artistic, but that's if an artist brings me the vision and they bring me a picture or something right. and they say, Hey Max, I got this idea. Can you make that? And I'll be like, yeah, okay, cool. Like I can make that and maybe put a little bit of flair in it just from a steel working point of view. But for me to sit down and just invent art, that is amazing. Like uh, even like you see that piece right behind me right there. Like, I mean, I, I had an artist, yes. I had an artist friend of mine, she does abstract art and she wanted to celebrate my new job working for the CWB. So she's like, I'll make you this art out of, you know, your company colors, which are right there. And, uh, she created that and it's like textured and it's like acrylic on canvas and like, I just don't get it. Like I don't, yes. my brain doesn't work like that. It's a good therapy too. Like when I go into the shop, you kind of turn off your brain and you're just doing it. You're not really Mm -hmm. thinking and it's nice. It's a, it's a nice relaxing thing. So is this like a full-time gig for you? Like, are you making money to survive off of this? Are you still picking up shutdowns or work from the UA on the side or? Nope. I, I still work full-time for UA local Mm -hmm. 46 and I'm with a contractor plan group. And I have a rig with them. It's their rig. And Mm -hmm. I do hot taps and I do a lot of pipe freezes and I do some shutdowns. So yeah, but because we only work 36 hours and that's kind of the bonus of the trades, if you want to tell people, (laughs) um, our Fridays are off. So that gives me like when my daughter's in school, I can kind of go down to the shop and work away and 
it gives me the space uh, a chance to kind of have a little side gig but i would love to do it full time that would be awesome so now that knows? Now that's the, the thing with <laughs> with the trade you can do anything yeah absolutely now that you have established yourself in your career, like you got, you're running a rig. So like, I mean, that's not a small deal for a contractor. It's, you know, you, they're lending you basically $150,000 of equipment to go out there and do something. And, uh, do you find you still have the same obstacles you had early in your career? Like, is it still like, I don't want Courtney to be on my team anymore or, or now have you established yourself as like, Oh no, here comes Courtney. She's going to nail this job. It's going to be done good. And it's all good. Yeah, look, I'm sh- so what was it recently? Recently, I actually, and I say recent, I think it was in the last five years, I did have a foreman turn me down for his job because he didn't want a woman on the on the job site. And I was actually taken back by it. I was like, wow, like I haven't had that happen in so long, right? Um, but it doesn't happen very often. And like you said, yes, you, if you can't, like, People are just used to me now and they know that I'm there in the trade for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. And um, I love my job and I'm competent at it. So um, I don't have a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. There's certain things that I don't like to work alone on a job if I'm, especially if I'm doing hot taps or whatever. Um, So I don't really like even though I'm kind of service, I always kind of like someone with me when I'm doing stuff. And quite frankly, I think that should be, most people should have someone with them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no people, I think I've earned respect and, uh, I am given it now too. Good. So Good. what's your, it's, best, it's a nice place to be. What's your best weld? What's, what's the rod position weld that you, you can make better than anyone you've ever met. You know what? (laughs) (laughs) Because my father was a pipeline welder, a downhand welder. Mm -hmm. I love welding downhand and I love um, a 60 10 rod or I just like, I know it's like a, it's like a people, an ugly looking rod. Like it doesn't get that nice finish, like a 70, 18 Mm -hmm. up end, but I just love it. Like, and, you know, the more sparks, the better. And uh, <laughs> I love stick welding. A lot of people say, oh, TIG welding is my favorite or whatever. I like stick welding. I do. Mm-hmm. So um, that's that's my favorite. Yeah, I dig it. I dig it too. Like I, I, I have a TIG in my garage and I'll do it here and there. And there's certain jobs you have to do with TIG. Like I get it. But in my career, yeah. I did mainly stick and Megan, lots of flux core. Um, so those are still in my mind my favorite things because I spent the most amount of time doing them. And, uh, and it was fun. For my career, I was a stainless guy. I did like all stainless jobs for probably 10 years. So like I love working with stainless. And lots of people are like, I hate working with stainless because it's crappy and slow and hard to control. And I'm like, man, that was my bread and butter. Like, <laughs> Right. Yeah. Okay, so I said especially up, stick welding stainless. Yeah, That's it's tricky. Well, and and if you do it right, it's beautiful, right? Mm-hmm. So I said I was going to throw a question on you because I've been having some conversations, and this is this is the question because I need you to teach me or to show me what I can do better now that I work at the association, the CWB association. So this is the conversation I had. I was talking to a friend of mine who was a previous guest. Um, she's a pipe, a pipe welder out in Ontario as well. Um, she has a pretty good career. She's been out there for a long time and we were just chatting on Instagram, you know, how are things going, blah, blah, blah. She had some cool projects she had posted up and I said to her, you know, like, you know, I'd love to have someone like you, you know, a woman who's crushing it in the careers and doing a good job and and has a great social media presence to, um, you know, be involved with one of the chapters for the CWB. And she said to me, what's a chapter? And I was taken aback, okay, because I grew up, and this is maybe my bias, I grew up in the welding world, so my dad was a part of the CWB uh, association, he was a ticketed welder, and of course, as me and API ticketed as well, but our local community was our local Regina chapter here in Regina, and I remember being a kid, my dad would take me to these bowling nights and pool nights, and he'd hang out with his welder buddies, and I'd just be like a 12-year-old kid hanging out, and it was always a part of my life, and I thought it was like something that all welders knew about. 
And as I've gotten older, I've realized that that's not true. Lots of people either don't know about the association or actually are negative towards the association and don't pass on information. And now, even more recently, I'm realizing that it's almost purposeful. Like, how can... Just to throw her under the bus, but just like, in general, a person like... Who's been through the apprenticeship system, through a union, 10 years of work... You know, been in the field and has never heard of her local CWB association chapter. Meanwhile, oh, this is easy. Like, I don't get it. But is, on the back end, this, all the unions are getting money from CWB. There's funding for scholarships. There's funding for bursaries. There's funding for this. There's all this stuff at the high schools and the colleges. Money is flowing out of CWB to support all the weld industry. Yet, for some reason, it doesn't get talked about. So. Tell me. Easy answer. Easy answer. Because we're UA Local 46. So we're pressure pipe welders. So CWB doesn't deal with that. Yes, and they do. you guys are... Well, okay. So <laughs> traditionally, we, mm-hmm. we don't deal with them because we're TSSA. Mm-hmm. Right. So that's why. Now, in saying that, um, because we are TSSA, so that's what we are ticketed under. So when we go test, we do our yearly test or a job-specific test. It is taken care of by TSSA. Mm -hmm. So now though, a lot of, uh, before it used to be, there used to be a rule that if the, if the pipe supports were structural, we need it. We didn't. And it was a pipe support. We did not need to acquire a CWB ticket. Uh, now I think on most jobs it's changed. And if we have to do any structural welding, including pipe supports on some jobs, we do have to have a CWB ticket. Now I do have a CWB ticket and I, I, um, I uh, still like test to it. I think, what is it? Every two years we do a check test. Mm-hmm. Yep. I, I do that and I maintain that. So I think that is why just because would have um, been a UA apprentice um, or even Boilermaker, they would have dealt with TSSA. So that's, that's where I think that disconnect is. Now in saying that, um, I myself also have dealt with the CWB and I have my uh, supervisor's ticket through you. And I also have um, my inspector's ticket, level one. And that's the different codes. And there's, um, is it B313, which is process piping, yep. which we deal with. And it's also Z662, six, six, two, which yeah. is pipeline. So, um, I, and I know a lot of UA welders, once they get further in their career and they start to understand and want to branch out more into inspection, that they take the courses for that. But I think just because um, it's that simple thing that we test under TSSA and that's where the people disconnect. are not aware. Yeah. And, you know, that's interesting because that's those are meetings that I'm, I'm sitting in on where I'm saying... The, okay, so for people that don't know that are listening, the CWB under CSA actually has codes for everything. Boiler, mm-hmm. pressure piping, uh, above ground and below ground, tanks. So your ASMEs, your APIs, your AAs, your RA, all of them have a CWB equivalent. But what's happened in the past is that lots of these contracts that happen with oil and gas and stuff like that, have American counterparts. So they come already coded to ASME or API. And so you get your local authority, which is your TSSA here in Saskatchewan. It's your uh, TSASC. So every province has their local authority that will test their um, pipe pipe and pressure boiler tickets, right? Yes. Now, hopefully going forward, my dream, my hope, is that eventually (laughs) Canadian welders all just test to Canadian standards because our standards for, for pressure piping and boiler are above ASME or at least equivalent. So instead of you having to have tickets from three different companies or three different associations, why can't you just have them all from one? You know what I mean? That would be so much easier. You just get your your pipe ticket, your, like your initial six, your two inch, and then you could do maybe some API tank requ- requirements, and then you could do your CWB structural all in the same test center, all at the same time, all under the same authority. That would be... I think best for everybody. That would be way easier. I don't know if that's going to happen anytime soon because that's kind of tricky. Now, 
how much do you know about the association, no. your local volunteer chapter? Have you ever been to a meeting? Do you know anything about them? Um, I've done work. So I think my closest uh, CWB would be in Milton. And that's a training center. And I think they test out of there also. Mm -hmm. they have so I've, I've taken courses there. That's, you know, to the extent of it. If but, I needed a course, but, I would take a course. So and the, then... Go ahead. Sorry. When I test every year, there is a school in Toronto that is able to test under CWB. So, yeah. Yeah. So the association has nothing to do with testing. Okay. And see, this is the interesting part. And I'm, I'm, I'm loving this conversation for the people that are listening. They can learn too. The CWB group is like six different agencies. And my agency that I specifically uh, work for has nothing to do with certification or testing or any of that stuff. Our role is literally to support welders and students and people in the trades in getting support in terms of education, work placement, um, guidance, mentorship programming, uh, all this stuff. And it's all free. Like I, we give money back. We actually don't take money. We're a not-for-profit. So we actually put money into welders' hands and programming into welders' things. And for me to have, you know, large groups of welding communities not even know that these supports exist is kind of mind-blowing because, I mean, why wouldn't every apprentice group, and like, trust me, when I go to these meetings for CWB, the UAs are all there. The iron workers, the pipe fitters, the boiler makers, they're all sitting around the table with me. We're all talking together and we're all talking about the money that we're going to be giving out and helping everybody with. And yet they go out or go back and it doesn't get into the membership. So no, I need to figure out how to fix that or how to work with that. Like, how can I, how can I get the word out there that there's this association that you'll have a local chapter of people in the trades that literally just want to help, you know, like, how do I, do you have any ideas? I don't know. Like. So most local unions have um, a uh, journal that goes out monthly. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like, could you get an advertisement space in that journal or a link on the members' web on the web page for the members? Well, on look, the members only. That's a good idea because we also we release a, a journal. You know, we have a, mm -hmm. a a magazine, Weld, the Weld magazine. Um, that's part of the association where we do stories and we promote. And yes, we, I've seen that, and I think I've even been in that and mm -hmm. wrote an article. And I get that electronically on mm -hmm. my, you know, through an email. So I think that would be key: is if you could get a link on the members only page or an advertisement in the journal that gets mailed out or the electronic version. And then that would be something like, Oh, let's click on that and see yeah. what they well, offer. That's a good idea. You yeah. know, like I worked for the iron workers for a few years as a permit uh, welder for the summers doing shutdowns and the iron workers are heavy CWB, right? Cause it's all structural. So they don't yeah, absolutely. So, even in that environment where everyone I'm working with has CWB tickets, like literally everyone has to have them. There was nobody that was involved in the association. And I was like, what do you, you know, you know, you're paying for these tickets or your company's paying for these tickets. Do you ever wonder where that money goes? It's like, no, CWB just makes all this money and keeps it. And it's like, <laughs> that's actually not at all how that works. The CWB is a not-for-profit. They take all this money and actually redistribute it back into schools and, 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 you know, into the trades and people are like, really? It's like, yeah, like the CWB group doesn't, isn't out there to make money. They charge you for services and then whatever's left over gets handed right back through the association and the foundation, which people are like, really? It's like, this, this has been around for like a hundred years and people it's don't like know. It's like the best kept secret though. Yeah. Nobody knows. I just learned something new. <laughs> yeah, for real. Like, like, I mean, so. I, I just took over as a board, uh, as a director for, for the association in January. Like I'm literally, it's my first month and I'm really passionate because I'm like you, I grew up in the trades. I worked in the trades. I'm not just some, you know, pencil pusher that's trying to be like, Oh, you should join the trades. Like, no, like I, I've pounded steel my whole life and I, I want, like you said, to make it easier for the next person behind me. Right. And, and the association is literally exists to do that. So I'm hoping that people listening go to the website, the association website, look up your local chapter. We got chapters across Canada and, and hook up with them. They got awesome stuff going on. That's, you know, that's <laughs> literally running every day. Like it's, it's amazing. 
That's good. I can pass that information on a lot because I get a lot of um, private messages through Facebook or through Instagram about women who are, you know, currently in a welding school and they want to know, okay, what do I do next? How do I get an apprenticeship? So if that's something that I can also pass on as a resource, or I get a lot of young boys like, okay, I'm kind of want to do welding, but I'm still in high school. What is there out, out there for me? So if I can pass that information on as another avenue, something that they can look into in the meantime until they can start their career or something that's a stepping stone for them, then that would be great. But yeah, I think the definite um, reason for this is just because we kind of just stay to our home locals and mm -hmm. that to us is our association. Yeah, that's United like your home. Yeah. yeah, that's our home local and we do all the things that you're talking about. We have training and, you know, all that at the union hall and we have, you know, Christmas parties. And so that just tends to be where our, our focus is. But again, we don't see you as that because maybe, yeah, maybe you need those links or advertisements. Yeah. And, and that's, and that's very much something that I I'd like to try to break down those barriers. I've noticed it my whole career. When you work for the iron workers, they make fun of the pipe fitters. When you work for the pipe fitters, they make fun of the boiler makers. When you make everyone's kind of got their lane and they kind of don't want to talk or work with the other lanes. And I don't I don't think that's a good thing. I think it's I think it's important that all the steel trades respects each other and 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 you know supports each other. The biggest one here in Saskatchewan is manufacturing. We're a heavy manufacturing province and we're non unionized manufacturing. So People really rag on non-unionized welders in manufacturing being like, oh, your job is just making the same part every day and oh, you just do this and you don't need any tickets or you don't need any schooling. And it's like, who are you to judge? They're feeding their families. They're living their right. lives. You know, they have a great job. And let me tell you, when oil and gas tanked, you know what? Manufacturing didn't. And so all those people that we made fun of, those thousands and thousands of workers out there that are working non-unionized in a private shop, they didn't lose their jobs. So at the right. end of the day... Work is work, right? Work is work. That's right. And uh, it's a balance. Everything in life is a balance, right? So, um, you know, you don't want everything maybe to be all union, but you don't want everything to be non-union. That's right. got to be a balance. And maybe together, the two industries can keep each other in check, right? Absolutely. The so. unions do fantastic stuff for wages. We do amazing uh, stuff. Benefits, pension safety. packets. Exactly. Um, Education. Mm -hmm. So, like, I mean, the unions are very necessary um, but also some companies are just too small to afford unions and, uh, right. and they just have to exist and, you know, we can't keep them out of the conversation. They have a right at, to be at the table as well. Yeah. And the, I mean, you can get into a whole conversation about like, you know, when, when people, when big companies go to other countries and they start manufacturing, like say shoes and, you know, the company could afford to pay their workers in their shoe factory huge amounts of dollars and people back in North America say, well, why don't they pay those factory workers huge amounts of dollars? And you can't because you can't upset their economy. kind of economy. You can't have a person who's working in a shoe factory making more than a doctor there. So there's rhyme and reason to everything. So I think people get kind of lost on that. So, you know, the unions are fantastic. We, we brought up the wages for the non-union and, it's great. Everyone's there for a purpose. And then as those companies grow and expand, they may make the decision then to become unionized. Exactly. And, and, you know, it's part of the product you're producing too. Like if I'm, if I'm building chairs, you know, metal chairs, well, metal chairs only sell for 10 bucks, you know, so I can't, mm -hmm. I can't have a, a person building that chair that makes $50 an hour. Like that's just doesn't make sense. And so, exactly. and if we force a company to do that, then basically the company goes under, well, that's not fair. We can't do that. Right. Right. So anyways, we're almost like at an hour here. So like, this has been an <laughs> awesome conversation. I hope you're having fun. I am. Okay, cool. Well, I'm going to try to wrap this up. I ask every guest the same question, um, at the end of the show. So like, this is just from you and your life and your, and your perspective, which I'm digging. It's been very, very informative is that. For the person behind you, the person coming up, or the, or the people that are looking at getting into the trades, maybe specifically your trade, what pieces of wisdom 
looking back on your life would you give someone now what pieces of advice and it could be to anybody or it could be to females specifically or whatever whatever you choose what do you think you would give as a piece of wisdom to someone coming up now oh geez yeah um i'm digging i deep. think it <laughs> i think um what i said earlier is just do your best and realize that your best is different every day and don't get too down on yourself. So if your best is like, you know what, getting to work, then that's your best. Uh, also, yeah, show up to work every day because I, <laughs> it's not hard. Like the, the trade really isn't that hard. Like if you just show up like right there, you got like 50% of these people beat. So <laughs> that's good too. <laughs> like, honestly, I would sit there sometimes in the morning and laugh because the crew made me look like a superstar because I just showed up on time. So that, that'll take you far too. It's amazing yeah. how true that is. I, I remember hiring somebody and they were late like the second day at work and I pulled them aside and they're like, well, I'm only five minutes late. I'm like, it's your second day. Like <laughs> what is going on in your head that you think that that's okay in any way? Like, Oh, and you cannot do it just for the money. So I hear a lot of like, yes, the money's great. You can support yourself, this and that. And my father actually told me this. He goes, if you're doing this for the money, don't do it. Because I love my job. It's fabulous. It's challenging. It, it's tiring. It's all those things. But there are too many days where it's like, this isn't worth it. <laughs> so you got to mm -hmm. like it. Like yeah. you do, like that's construction. So, and you can tell, you can tell if people are just there for the money and mm. you don't want to work with those people. So you really do have to enjoy it. And um, it's okay not to enjoy it. It's okay to just try it. And if it's not for you, then that's fantastic. There's no shame in that, but try it and, and see if you like it. If you're, if you're on the fence and you're kind of like, should I, shouldn't I just try it? What do you got to lose? Yeah. And you know, Flipping careers is not a big deal. Like lots of people flip careers and I've flipped careers mm -hmm. many times. It always works out. It works out for the best in the end because you're always learning, right? Exactly. Cool. Well, Courtney, thank you very much. Um, maybe you want to do a shameless plug for yourself. How do people find you on, on Instagram or social media or your art? How do people find your art so that they can take a look at it? So you can find me through kickasscareers.org, uh, kickasscareers on instagram and then chard courtney on instagram for my art okay so i'll make sure that all the stuff is flagged on our end when we post the podcast so we'll have all your instagram tags and your information out this has been a fantastic interview i hope uh, it was good for you too and uh, yes it was and in the future i'll look back and and maybe we'll circle back and see what, what you're up to with your career in a in a little while and and see if we can do a part two Sounds great. Thank you for the opportunity. Awesome. Thanks a lot. And thank you for everybody that's been following the podcasts. Make sure you share them, download them, and let the community know. Also, make sure you go to the association website, cwb cwbgroup.org backslash association, or just Google it. Sign up. It's free. You get, uh, you get to pick your local chapter. A list comes up by Canada. You find the one that's closest to you. You become a member. And like I said, it's free and it opens up all this information and content for you. We just revamped our website. We got another big revamp coming up and we got an awesome free industry meeting coming up in February. So make sure you're a part of it. Make sure you get clued in. If you're in the education system, especially plug in because there's lots of stuff coming out for, for high schools and post-secondary in the next little while. So cool. Thanks everyone. And take care. We hope you enjoy the show. You've been listening to the CWB Association Welding Podcast with Max Cerrone. If you enjoyed what you heard today, rate our podcast and visit us at cwbassociation.org to learn more. Feel free to contact us if you have any questions or suggestions on what you'd like to learn about in the future. Produced by the CWB Group and presented by Max Haran. This podcast serves to educate and connect the welding community. Please subscribe and thank you for listening.